How's it going ladies and gentlemen, Data here and welcome to the ultimate guide for everything franchise mode on NHL 23. In this video I will be bringing you through everything and I mean everything on franchise mode, every screen, every option, any question that you could ever imagine will be addressed in this video. So go ahead and use the timestamps down below. This was a very successful video in NHL 22, one of my most popular on the channel as many people had questions answered as yes I'm going to be going through the things like what is how to make trades how to draft players but we'll also be going through my recommended settings tips how to maximize the mode even when certain things are glitched and much much more so if you're looking for certain questions go ahead and use those timestamps to find the section that you're looking for maybe you're a brand new player and you want to hear everything that I have to say or you're an experienced player in franchise mode and you just want to see what perhaps other players do when it comes to their settings etc so sit back, relax, and I hope that you'll enjoy and that it will be helpful for you. I'll go ahead and start the video just by saying if you do have a question that is not answered in this video, as it could happen, please do leave a comment down below. We're over 5,000 subscribers on the channel. There are many people who would love to answer your questions. And also consider joining our Discord server where we're talking all about our own franchise modes, helping each other out, giving each other tips, telling each other about how our franchise modes are going. So the Discord server is in the description I'll put it in a pinned comment as well and we'd love to have you join on so starting off your franchise mode before you even click on franchise mode something that you need to be aware of is that in NHL 23 you can use roster sharing so at the very least you go over to more and you click on rosters you'll want to have the most recent roster at the very least the most recent EA roster so that you can get the most updates players that have been traded players that have been signed most recently as I'm recording this video uh, in mid-November the most recent uh, roster update comes from November 10th I have my own custom roster or if you, you know that's because I made my own changes or you can go ahead and click on excuse me scroll down when you're on the more page and click on roster sharing from roster sharing you can then go to download community files and you can click on whatever you know whatever file you want. Do you want KHL rosters? Do you want Ultimate Rosters V1? Realistic ro rosters. Uh, different people that are known for different things. You might have a certain creator that you want to check out. I do have my own roster as well, somewhere down here. Data Cap Compliant 2. This is my most recent one where I adjust player salaries so that uh, because LTIR is not in franchise mode, I adjust player salaries. So I'll get into that later on when I'm talking about the salary cap, but I do have my own if you want to use my rosters. It's not like I get any bonus money or anything when I uh, when people download it, but if you want to do it, use them, you can be aware that those are available. Once you have chosen a roster, whether it be through downloading one or through editing one yourself, make sure you go to rosters, click on active roster, and make sure that is the roster that is checked off. Whatever roster is checked off will be the one that is used when you start your franchise mode. So I'm happy with my roster. I have a check mark next to it. Now I go to franchise mode. So I go to the offline modes, click on franchise mode, and click on creating a new mode. When I go to new mode, it will give me a few different options. Now, first off, I can do the regular traditional 32 team franchise mode. Use an authentic NHL rule set and play through your career. That you can do. That's what we're going to be doing in this video mostly. But there's also now new to NHL 23 custom leagues. I'll get into that last because I also want to highlight that there is the 33 team, 33rd team expansion draft option where you start as an expansion team and you will create your roster through uh, get it th through doing the expansion draft. So the roster type that you'd like to use, default, custom, or go back, cancel. I would say custom. I'm going to go ahead and use the roster that I wanted to use. Default would be day one rosters. And then I would have to go ahead and select a team that I had previously created in creation zone or click on create a team and it'll bring you through all the steps of creating a team, the arena, the jerseys, the name, the logo, all those things right here, branding, mascot, all the things that I won't do right now because it's pretty self-explanatory. If you want to go through and try it out, you can do the expansion draft, choose your team, and then the franchise mode begins. So that's if you want to do the 33rd team. 
Custom League does not necessarily have to mean that it's not a 32 team league. When you click on Custom League, it could be a regular NHL league, but you just make a few tweaks to it. New to NHL 23 is an enormous amount of customizability. You can go all the way down to a six team league. So you can have an original six, whatever you want to do, or you can go all the way up to into the forties. You can have a 48 team league. So between six and 48 teams can be in your league. I will mention as fun as it is to have 48 teams, unless they're created teams, it, it's not as fun because you have 32 NHL teams who are all, let's say, 85 overall caliber. And then you bring in, let's say, teams from Sweden, teams from Finland, and they're mostly like 60, 70 overall teams. So they're always at the bottom of the league standings. So it's a cool idea, but it doesn't always work if you want to just do NHL teams plus Swedish teams. Depends, you know, whatever you have fun with. That's the key, that's the only, that's the key word in customizability. Whatever makes you enjoy it more. You can change the number of conferences, the number of divisions, salary cap on or off, salary cap inflation on or off. It may sound like a no-brainer to keep it on, but honestly, if I was doing a crazy like 25-year 4018 custom league, I'd probably turn it off because by the time you get to year 20, 22, 25 of your franchise mode, let's say you have an 81 overall defenseman who in 2022 is taking whatever, 3% of your salary because he's asking for 1 million. Now in 2000 and whatever, 45, Yes, it makes sense that he wants more, but now he's asking for like 8 million. So contract demand asks go up disproportionately to the salary cap inflation. So I would consider turning it on or off, maybe even just turn it off in your normal uh, franchise mode so that it's always the same thing. You know, you always have your top players making eight, nine, 10 plus million. You always have your third, fourth liners making one, two, three million, but that's up to you. You can also just turn off player salary scaling to uh, which is which uh, goes in relation to the minimum and maximum salary cap values you can change around the salary cap minimum and max salary cap minimum salary cap maximum by the time you get to year 25 it'll be 125 million if you start with 82 million for example player salary max um, rookie salary max all that stuff you can touch this is probably the most that i would touch if i was doing a custom league NHL schedule, I'm not sure if I would change this much aside from the number of games. It doesn't really change my life if I have 24 or 28 interconference games or whatever, or 32. That doesn't really change my life that much. I would maybe even touch the standings format if you like maybe changing the points for wins and losses, shootout wins, stuff like that. After this is where it really starts to drop off in my opinion because you can do like, oh well, in the playoffs, do you want the round of 16 to be home, home, away, away, home, away, home? Or do you want to do away, 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 home, 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 home? Or do you want home, 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 away, 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 home? Or do you want home, home, away, 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 home? I find like it's just way too much that no one, like we asked for customization in franchise mode. I don't feel like anyone really asked for this. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I don't really care about. Uh, you can, uh, the playoff qualification can be touched as well. Regulation wins, tiebreakers, blah, blah, blah. After that, like I said, it starts to drop off and you can do the exact same thing in the AHL. But again, I don't feel like anyone's really breaking their heads to say, well, no, I gotta have, make sure it's 32, not 34 interconference AHL games, stuff like that. I don't feel like it really matters that much, but whenever you're happy, you click X and you advance, your settings are good. And then you start your franchise mode. So nothing different from that page. Now I'm gonna go back to where we were and continue from uh, with the assumption that we're doing a traditional franchise mode, which is where we would pick up once we did the creation of the team or the customization of the league. All right, so now here we are at the name. You gotta enter your name first. Let's go ahead and say uh, data test because I don't wanna mix it up with my current franchise mode series, data test. And then you can go ahead and select the team that you would like. You have the choice of all 32 NHL teams. It tells you the AHL affiliate, uh, tells you all the stats. If you have owner mode on, stuff like that. Is your owner, does it, does your owner think that, that success is very important? Does your owner have a lot of patience, etc.? And who are your top players? What's your team budget? So on and so forth. Now, if you want to substitute a team, like let's say you want to take out one of the lower teams in the league, you say, I want the Coyotes to come out. You press square, I'm on PlayStation 4. You remove a team and you can put in any other team. It could be an alumni team. You can do a full alumni. Put in the Coyotes alumni. I got Shane Doan in there. Alumni of any other of the any other team. You got the Hartford Whalers, Minnesota North Stars, 
NHL Alumni Association or NHL Alumni All Time. You can also put a created team if you created any. I have not created any, so it doesn't give me the option. But if you create a team, you could also do that. So I'm not going to substitute any teams, though. I'm going to go ahead and just select the Canadians. I usually just select the Canadians when I do these videos. I'm a Habs fan. Why not? And then once I do that... I can go to division realignment. I can keep everything as is, or I can swap them some things around. I want Detroit to go back to being a Western Conference team. I swap them with Winnipeg, whatever I want, I can do that. This was fun when the NHL was in a bubble and you could you know create the all Canadian division and stuff like that. But for the most part, I don't usually touch that. It's maybe it's usually if you have a created team and you want to swap some places around. Now, here are the big settings that most of these you got to decide on now. You can't go back later and choose owner mode on or off, fantasy draft on or off, salary cap on or off. You got to choose this now. So personally, when I play my franchise mode, I have my settings look like this. Salary cap on, CPU trades on, and nothing else. Now, I'm going to show you how, you know, you might be someone who likes morale and owner mode, so I'm going to turn those on as well to show you how they work. Same for Fog of War. Uh, head coach, I'm the one always doing my lines. You want to have the possibility of getting fired. Personally, I would keep this off no matter what because you can get fired for some really wacky reasons even when you're like a really good team. Auto staff management, I keep it off because I like to do it myself. Auto sign free agents, I also keep that off. Auto accept relocation, that's up to you. And auto owner mode, I find that kind of just, you might as well turn off owner mode at that point if you're just going to do auto owner mode but i'm going to show you how the game looks when i have owner mode morale and fog of war all turned on three things that personally i don't like to play with because i think that they're kind of broken for various reasons that i won't get into right now but like for example in morale i've had it happen to me before where I've a, I keep a player out of the lineup because he has a playable injury and I don't want him to get hurt again. And then he'll say, oh, why didn't you play me? And now he demands a trade and he went from an 86 overall to a 79 overall. And basically I lost a player all because I tried to keep him safe. So morale and the morale meetings, the same conversations get really stale after like a year. So and I'm not a morale user. Now, when it gets into the settings, we start with quick settings. Gameplay presets, I've, this is because I've touched it. If I didn't touch anything, you would have, you know, it'd say save preset, etc. But because I've touched things, it's currently at an unsaved preset. Game style, I usually have to go four on four, or four out of four for the full sim. Uh, I don't really go into my game games really too often. I go to watch the playoffs sometimes. I don't play any of my games, so I'm not a guy who touches the sliders too, too much, but I keep it four on four. It says it's the most realistic setting. It's not as fast paced and extreme and arcade. So I go four on four for that. Injuries, I keep turned on. Period of length, it's up to you. Fantasy Draft, if you want to do that, you turn it on, and that allows you to recreate the entire league, just like, it, you know, it, as the, the title says. You have the first overall pick, and you're Dallas, you take Connor McDavid. Authentic cap penalties, uh, so players in the real world who have been bought out and their teams are in the hole, whatever number, million of millions of dollars, you can keep that on or off. Auto sign, we said that already. Franchise mode length, the max is 25 years for some unknown reason. So usually I just put it 25, even if I stop after 12 or 15, I have the option. Difficulty, I keep it on superstar, even though I'm not playing, just so that when I go into the game, the goalies are playing a bit more uh, realistically. Draft pick ownership, do you want authentic or classic? Authentic would be according to real life teams that have traded their picks away. Salary cap turned on. Trade difficulty, I always keep it on hard. It's up to you if you want easier or medium, but I always keep it on hard. Waivers turned on, relocation off, fog of war is on. Show Now, in the fog of war, you can go a bit deeper. You can keep everything off where I know nothing. That I don't like. You're going to tell me that I know nothing about Connor McDavid, and I can't even know that he's a 96 overall unless I dedicate like three weeks to scouting him. So I don't like fully everything is hidden. I like show me the overall. I also like show me the player type. It just takes two seconds to look that up. Uh, sh show potential. That could be okay. I need to send my scout to see what kind of potential he has. Player role. I don't mind my scout going to check that out. And even uh, show individual attributes. I'd probably turn that on. So if I was doing Fog of War, these are the only two things that I would keep off. But usually I don't use Fog of War at all. Auto scouting turned off. I want to do it myself. Auto staff management turned off. I want to do it myself. All right, those are the quick settings. Now the advanced settings into franchise mode. Head coach edits lines. No, I want to do them myself. And NHL injury return warning. So no. let's say I have a player who's injured for four weeks. I only want to bring that player back 
in four weeks. Because if they tell me that he's eligible to return after three weeks and it's a playable injury, it could be that he gets re-injured and now he's out for six weeks. So I don't like to risk it, especially in EA land where that happens more often than not. I tell me only, don't even let me know that he's eligible. Only contact me and give me a notification when the player is fully healed. Auto goalie rotate, always keep that on unless you want your goalie playing 80, starting 82 games. Sim engine scoring. Now, you could go low, medium, or high. This is very difficult because you're, you're trying to find a balance between the players are scoring and the goalies aren't too bad. But, you know, if you go low, McDavid's scoring 70, 80 points. Yeah, more, yeah, more like 80. If you're going medium, he's more at 90. And if you go high, even then, like, it, then it becomes almost too crazy sometimes at high where McDavid's scoring too much and your goalies are all like your Vezina winners at a 902 save percentage. So usually you can, I just either go medium sim engine scoring with medium sim engine shot frequency. So if Ovechkin's taking 300 shots, he's taking 300 shots. If I'm going higher, maybe he's taking 350, 400. If I go lower, maybe he's into the 200s. But I usually go medium, medium. In my current franchise mode series, I'm doing an experiment where I have, I think it's low, either it's, I forgot what it is, it's high end. I did high scoring with low shooting or it was low scoring with high shooting. I think that's what it was. But I'm, it's, it's something that I'm still trying to experiment with because in these EA games, it's very rare to find consistent, like real world results. You're never going to get goalies who are on fire. And by the way, McDavid's also scoring 130 points. It's either going to be there are a ton of 100 plus point scores and your goalies are terrible or your Art Ross winner has like 93 points. And there are all kinds of goalies with like plus 930 save percentages. It's really tough, but I often just put it medium, medium and let the world be as it is. Draft class quality and prospect quality, uh, generated prospect quality. Over the years, obviously in year one, you have Connor Bedard, you have real life prospects. Over the years, you're gonna get generated prospects who are created. Yes, if you download the right or uh, roster or if you create your own rosters, you can have some 16 year olds who in the future get drafted in year two, year three. But eventually we get to year six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Those guys are all fake. They're not real anymore. So do you want the generated prospects to be low, medium, or high? High, you might get like a franchise guy every season. Medium, you'll get some medium elites out there. Low, it'll be not the greatest top five picks every season. Usually I start medium, medium, and then every off season I'll use a number generator. And if I get between one and 30, I'll go low. If I get between like 30 and 70, I'll go medium. And if I get like 70 to 100, I'll go high. I just try and mix it up that way. But again, medium, medium, not a bad way to go. Playoff series length, playoff break, uh, tie break, all that stuff. Authentic, authentic, authentic season tie break. Do you want pop-ups when other coaches get fired? Do you want pop-ups when trades are sent your way? Or maybe only when stars are sent your way? Gameplay version is the latest. Waiver notifications, morale meetings. You can turn that off if you are playing with morale on. I'll keep it on just to show you what it is. Retired jerseys turned on and blockbuster trade alerts also turned on. Lastly, we have the gameplay sliders. I don't really touch these too much. I know many people live and die by how can I get the most realistic sliders. That would be like a whole nother video in and of itself because there are a lot of sliders you can touch upon. There are some great threads out there on Reddit, etc. that tell you more about this. I personally don't like touching them too much because I just want to simulate. I just want to have fun. And if there was a way to get perfect simulation, I would put in the work, but I feel like even when you put in, like I've done the work to get the sliders exactly what I've seen online and then I sim and I, I don't know if I find the biggest differences. No, every, it's different for everybody. But the one slider I do touch is injury occurrence. 50 on 100, you're going to get injuries in your NHL and AHL lineup every two, three games. Way too much, especially that it takes so long to edit lines and there are glitches in edit lines that you're going to see later on. It is such a huge process to replace players who get injured. I prefer to keep the slider anywhere between 10 and 15 on 100, usually like something on 12 on 100. That'll, you know, I'll still get, sometimes there's going to be the injury bug. Sometimes there might be a season where I only get like two injuries, but I find that this is a good middle ground. Anywhere between 10 and 15, 15 is like just going from 12 to 15, you'll feel the difference. 50 out of 100, I find is absolutely incredibly insane. I'll keep it on 50 just so I can show you later on how hard it is to change lines when it happens so frequently, but 
I go 12 out of 100, sometimes higher, sometimes lower. If I got a whole season with no injuries, I might put it up. If I got too many injuries and I'm fed up, I might put it down to 10. So the settings are all taken care of. You can do, you can play with that as you like, but those are the settings that I usually like to use when I start my franchise mode. You click on start career and a little pop-up will come right here. Salary cap warning. Are you sure you want the salary cap on? The system will now fix some teams that are non-cap compliant before continuing. So I press keep salary cap on, but that is because I have my cap compliant roster. If you're on PS4, you can download the one that I created. Making your rosters cap compliant will keep the game, the AI, whatever, from changing player salaries. Now, if I did not touch my rosters and I did say, oh yes, please do make team salary cap compliant, a team like Vegas, for example, would have Jack Eichel making maybe 8.5 million, Petrangelo making 8 million. So Jack Eichel, instead of 10 million per season for the next how many years? For the next four years, Vegas now gets cut a break and they only got to pay him 8.5. I don't like that. I would rather go in and change some salaries. For example, I make Phil Kessel a 750K league minimum. I make Nolan Patrick league minimum. I make Brett Howden league minimum. And that allows Vegas to just be under the salary cap. You see they have 0 0.525 million cap space so that the long-term deals are not touched. Teams like Vegas, teams like Toronto, teams like Tampa Bay, they don't get a break where in five years they can have a better team because their stars are not making as much. No, they have to deal with the contracts that have been signed in the real world. So you can either download my rosters or you can go to the Puckpedia article that I've written that gives all the details on this. Or you can even watch the video that I put out to detail all the changes that I made. So check out the, the card or the link in the description, whatever's popping up on the screen or in the pinned comment. You can do that to change your rosters to keep the AI from changing player salaries, which I feel impacts the enjoyment of the franchise mode in the later years. So you can either download my rosters or do that yourself. Downloading my rosters or anyone else's roster also gives you the option of having created prospects who are not yet in the game. For example, we have Mishkov, we have Fantilli. These are players who are real life prospects who are coming into the NHL in 2023, but because they are playing in leagues that EA does not have the rights to, they cannot use the players. So to again, to keep it more realistic, instead of just Bedard and Jaeger, now I have Mishkov, Bedard, Fantilli, Jaeger, and now we can say, ah, it's a more realistic draft class, and once again, it plays into my franchise mode can be more realistic. So here we are at the hub. At the top, you can see hub, team management, owner, and league tabs. We're gonna start with the hub. First off, on the left of hub, you see the NHL Shield logo and the options button. If you press on that, it flips it to the AHL, AHL team management, AHL, uh, well, pretty much the owner tab and the league tab are still the same, but just pretty much for the team management. Edit lines in the AHL as opposed to edit lines in the NHL. So that's your ability to switch between managing the NHL and the AHL lineups and uh, jersey numbers and stuff like that. You see in this big box right here, we have the next game. We can simulate up to it. So instead of clicking on advanced day seven times you can just click on sim to next game it'll bring you right to it we'll do that later on once you do get there i'll give you the option to play the game sim the game but we'll see that in a little bit or you can go to the calendar in the calendar you can sim long term multiple months you can go all the way to january whatever for example sim to this day and it'll start simulating pop-ups will come trades injuries they'll tell you you can stop simulating but you can just try going all the way there. You can also flick between NHL, AHL, same as before with the options button on PlayStation. Not much happens here aside from simulation. Like if I sim through the Detroit game, I can't go back and click on it and see, okay, what was the box score from that game? It's too late. It'll tell me the score of that game, but that's it. So when you simulate through a game, it is gone forever, unfortunately. You see the result, but you can't go back and see what happened in it. From there, you can also see your team leaders in points. You can see the league standings flicking through the four divisions. Of course, being the Atlantic, our team is highlighted there, the Canadians. We have the quick links, advancing a day, go to the edit lines, go to player morale, stuff like that. And we also have the franchise overview. We have the profit, arena level, rating, ownerness, happy, owner happiness, blah, blah, blah. If I want to click on franchise overview, it tells me what's the attendance every uh, last game, what's the owner's expected profit, what's the annual net profit. 
All of this, honestly, could be really cool, but I find that it's a bit of a scam. Like, for example, if I upgrade and maintain, uh, like, is it the bathrooms that are always low? Yeah, the bathrooms are always low to start at 56 on 100. I say, okay, I'm going to go upgrade the bathrooms. And it brings me to that screen, and I say, okay, the bathrooms need come on they need to be upgraded now it's going to cost me three hundred and twelve thousand dollars to make the fans happy if i like win the stanley cup and meet a major owner goal he gives me like twenty five thirty thousand dollars so if i like if i win the cup i get a thirty thousand dollar bonus but it costs three hundred plus thousand dollars to maintain the bathrooms, so I find it's just it's you know it's disproportionate. It's not realistic. I'm not a fan of doing it. But if you want to see the franchise overview, it's there. What do you got to upgrade and maintain? It's all in one spot as opposed to having to go to that screen I just went to. What's the fan happiness? Oh, the arena level happiness is not too good right now. I got to go upgrade it. Owner goals? Have I met them? See, I get I do all those sellouts. I make millions of dollars. I get fifty thousand bucks. That's it. I win this game. I sell all these tickets, 30,000 bucks, 40,000 bucks. Like a D-rated scout costs like 80,000 bucks. A top scout costs 150,000. This 30 and 40K is not giving me anything. So team information, who are my locker room leaders, who are my non-leaders, who's happy, who's not happy, how many sellouts have we had? These are, I like these stats. How close are we to the deadline? Who's available? When's the draft? Who's a, who are the upcoming free agents? Who's a free agent right now? Who's injured? I, I appreciate the overview of all of that. Who are my scouts? Blah, blah, blah. So that's the franchise and like owner mode overview. From there, I'm now going to move to the team management tabs. We have a lot of screens to get through. Starting with propose trade. Now, trading in general, there's the trade finder, there's the trading block, there's trade value. There's a lot of things to keep in mind because I'm sure if you're playing this game, you at least know that players get traded for each other and you want to get even trade value and stuff like that. I'm going to just show you, for example, the players that are highlighted in green are players that the other team wants. You can sort your entire team by all skaters, and it goes by trade value from top to bottom. You can just look at your forwards, at your defense, at your goalies. Goalies have much less trade value than players for some reason, so those are usually easier to trade for. I can just look at my rookie skaters as well. I can also look at skaters who are matching their block exclusively, the, the, the other team being Anaheim right now. I can also look at draft picks and which ones do they want. They want all of them. So a player or a draft pick that another team wants will make that deal more likely to go through just as a, trying to acquire a t player or a pick that the other team wants to trade away will also make that deal more likely. If I, to try to get, if I want John Klingberg and he has that much trade value and I'm offering, let's say I go to my draft picks, they want my picks and I say I'm going to give you a second round pick the value is pretty fair. This might be close to going through. It might have to only add like a third or a couple fourths. It would go through because both sides want everything that's going on. Montreal will be over the salary cap, so it wouldn't work, but just saying in trade value. If the Ducks did not want this pick and or did not want to trade Klingberg, even if I gave even trade value, the trade would not happen. When you're trying to trade for a player who is not on the trade block, and especially if your trade, trading is set to hard, a uh, trade difficulty is set to high, it'll be next to impossible to trade for that player, especially if they're a big player. Let's say I want Trevor Zegras. There's no way I get Trevor Zegras unless I'm really overpaying. According to trade value, that would have to probably be Slavkovsky. I doubt even Caulfield or Suzuki would make it happen. Now, would that happen in the real world? Would they trade Slavkovsky? Would the Ducks trade Zegras for Slavkovsky? Probably not. But I'm just saying in trade value, look how much more trade value I'd have to give. And even then, I'm not sure if this would go through. So that being said, that's how trades work. You want to try and also always acquire players that teams are looking to trade away. If, for example, I was trying to do that trade with John Klingberg and now all my teams over the salary cap, what you can also do is have teams or even, uh, yeah, say $7 million player. I can have a team retain salary up to 50%. If that team has not already uh, um, retained the salary on two other players, I can say, okay, you're making 7 million. I want you to retain 3.5 million, but this does increase the trade value. If you notice the bar just went up a little bit, this increases the trade value on John Klingberg, but now I can make the trade because I, my team would be salary cap compliant. I'd be over by 600 K, but then I can move some players around and I can make it work. 
because the t the player has retained salary his value has gone up and it would be the same thing for me if i tried to retain salary on my players so you can go through usually around the trade deadline you want to go through and check the trade blocks etc but you can also do the find trade now find trade is not great because it doesn't give you every trade that is possible it just gives you every trade that works with other teams trade blocks so for example if i put slavkovsky on the block I would not get offered Trevor Zegris and other players that maybe it would go through if I offered it. I would only get teams that have players on their block. So for example, if I put, let's say, Justin Barron on the block, I can almost guarantee that I would get a John Klingberg offer here from the Anaheim Ducks because he's on their block. I go to Anaheim, here you go, I get a third and a fourth, Kulikov, maybe not John Klingberg, but I see that Grant and Kulikov are both players who are on their blocks. But if I sent Justin Barron for a second round pick to Anaheim, would this work? Yes, it probably would work. So it's not every deal possible. It's just every deal that uh, the other teams are willing to trade to me based on what they want to trade away. So when you highlight a player, you can either click on L1, which is find a trade on the open block, what no matter what your team wants, or you can tr press triangle, which will find trades based on what your trade block wants are. So already I lost all those deals from Anaheim and everybody else because on my trade block, it says I only want picks and not players. So now I'm getting only the pick offers. Okay, so that's the trade block. You can also add multiple players to the to the trade you're looking for. Baron and Heinemann. Ah, well now I go in the open block. Loading, 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 and the offers that I'm getting, I get two seconds from the Oilers, two seconds from the Wild, two seconds from the Devils, as opposed to just the one second that they were offering me previously. Also, usually when a team offers you, like let's say I, I could have gotten a second for Justin Barron, if you go to edit trade and add a seventh round pick, that team will usually still accept it, so you can squeeze a little extra value out of the deal. So there's proposed trade, find trade. That's how you look at other teams' trading blocks in, by, on the trade screen. You could also fix your own trading block by putting players you want to trade on there, such as Byron, Armia, some draft picks. What are my surpluses? What kind of forwards do I have too many of? What do I want? What kind of defenseman? What kind of goalie? What kind of picks? There's my depth chart at the bottom. I can also browse the trading blocks this way, but personally, I hate doing this because it doesn't show you everything that's available. Like for example, we saw that, uh, you'll see that some teams have multiple players on the block and you can just see them all in one place. Here I have to scroll down the line and it only shows me five. The Coyotes could have all kinds of picks on the block, it's only showing me a few. Uh, maybe their fifth, sixth, and seventh are also on the block, but it's only showing me up to five options. The Bruins could have more on the block, but I don't know, it's only showing me five options again. It does show you the assets on the block. The good news is that it tells you about their surplus and their wants, but it doesn't tell you everyone that is uh, every asset that they have on the block. So I prefer to look at it through the proposed trade screen. Moving on now to the coaching staff. Now the coaching staff is actually pretty important in franchise mode. You may not think it because they're not really doing anything on the ice, but they're doing a lot behind the scenes that, and it's hard to put your finger on it, but anecdotally, they seem to have a big impact and it's not just, and you know, it's many people who say that. So your head coach has to be, in my experience, at the very least, like B plus is pushing it. I would be more comfortable with an A minus, if not an A or A plus. In my mind, A minus is really the minimum for a head coach if you want to be a successful team. If you want to tank, the number one thing you'd have to do is fire a head coach and get like a C rated head coach. It's very rare that a team with a C or B rated head coach will do very well unless it's just way too OP. So the game gives you four staff members in the NHL and four in the AHL to start your career. You don't need to have assistant and goalie coaches, but you always need to have head and associate coaches in the two leagues or else the game will automatically sign them for you. So you want a coach that has good offense, good defense, obviously. Special teams I find aren't as important. They are important, but I'd rather have the offense and defense. And the teaching and coach influence will be good for your prospects. When it comes to their technicality, their teaching specialty, whatever you want to call it, generalists are usually pretty solid unless you really want to focus on, okay, I have an offensive prospect, so I'm going to get an offensive-minded coach. Now, offensive-minded coach doesn't mean that they're going to be scoring more, and defensive tech teaching specialty coach does not mean that they're going to be, okay, let's focus on defense and we don't score a lot of goals. Keep in mind, this is teaching specialty. Teaching, not style. The style is balanced. If you look in, in here, we see style balanced. 
the goalie coach here style physical his teaching specialty is for goalies but it's different than the style so don't be fooled by okay i have a forwards coach oh well he must be really offensive no no his style may be offensive that here's a coincidence but his specialty is forward so if you have forwards with high potential you might want to get a forward specialty coach if you have a lot of defensemen with high potential on your team, you may want to get a defensive teach, a defenseman teaching specialty coach. It doesn't mean that your team will be more defensive. It means that your defensemen will have a better chance of growing. You can also, if you press on options or bring to the higher coach page, you'll also see their specialties for uh, veterans. So if you have a lot of older players on your team, having a veteran teaching specialty coach will keep your veterans from regressing more than they already will at the ages of whatever, 34 to 36, etc. So the teaching specialty is important, but don't get it mixed up with the style. Veteran, his style is teacher. This guy has, defense. okay, so here's another co coincidence. Defensive specialty, defensive style. Vincent Gervais Chouinard. How about that for a name? So keep that in mind. Usually goes hand in hand that forwards are more offensive, but it's not necessarily true. Uh, same thing for generalist. Usually they're balanced, but it's not always true. This generalist has a physical style. So all things to be kept in mind. Usually I fire my E-rated coach as soon as I begin the, the franchise mode. And I'll go sign like a C-minus rated goalie coach because I don't have much of use, <laughs> use for someone who's E-rated. Uh, your head coach will also tell you their team fit. With my lineup and my players where they are in the lineup, I have a 66% team fit. I can see full bars for guys like David Savard, and I think even uh, uh, Jack Guy has a full bar, Pizzetta has a close to a full bar, but not that great for Cole Caulfield, a guy who I really want to have a long-term success on this team. So that goes into their check marks and their line score and their line chemistry. It doesn't matter as much in NHL 23 as it did in previous NHLs because it's really just all about the X factors now. So I wouldn't put too much stock into team fit as I may have put in previous NHLs where I'd want 60% plus. I wouldn't mind even having a 50% team fit coach as long as he's A or A plus rated and my players have X factors, whatever. So that's the coaching there. You can press on square and fire him if you want. If you have owner mode turned on, you have to keep the staff salary in mind. But if you have owner mode turned off, you can totally disregard... But if you have owner mode turned off, you can totally disregard the salary staff for the most part. There's been a glitch in previous NHLs where sometimes it tells you in the off season that you don't have enough money. I haven't had enough experience in NHL 23 to see if that glitch is still there. But for the most part, 90% of the time, the budget does not matter if owner mode is turned off. You can sign your, play your coaches for as much as you want. Um, and you also have the staff morale, which is important. You want a good coach, a good head coach, a good staff around him or her, and you need to have staff chemistry. It's probably around 70% plus. If you have good coaches, but the staff chemistry is at 50, you got to find who to fire. Same thing for the AHL down here at 75%. I want to have a coach who has good teaching and coach influence attributes since I usually typically have my younger prospects in the AHL. And I can also look at my staff screen. On my scout screen, I can assign scouts. I can fire scouts. I usually like to sort by region and then I go through and assign them individually. I'm going to have another video out on how to scout. My previous video on scout HL 22 can still be used because that is not changed whatsoever. Aside from the fact that in HL 23, because line fits don't really matter, if you have fog of war turned off, you can fire all of your pro scouts and just keep only amateur scouts, or you can just reassign your pro scouts to amateur leagues. This guy's NHL Atlantic, but I see that he's A minus rated in the AHL in the USA Central, so I'll send him to USA Central maybe. The way I like to divide my scouts, just if I could tell you a quick little rundown, I like to have two in Russia, two in Liga, two in the SHL, one in the Extra Liga, one USA Central, one USA West, one USA East, two QMJHL, two OHL, two WHL, and then I'll usually keep two for the NHL. So 18 amateur, two pro. But if you have Fog of War turned off, you could probably go 20 amateur and add a couple of roaming scouts, go wherever you find that they're needed. When you're scouting, usually I just go ahead and click and go to scout specific prospects. I'll click on the prospect, scroll to potential and comparison, and then I'll do all of that until maybe January. Then I'll do it again till April. As you see the estimated date at the bottom, okay, January 6th. 
and then I'll do another one until April, then I'll do another one until June. Depends how, you know, how many prospects are in each region, but for a quick explanation on scouting, that's usually what I do, and I fire all the ones I don't need. I click on options, it takes you to the higher staff screen, and I go ahead and uh, hire new scouts. Now, every July 1st, you'll want to reassess your scouting staff. Like for example, there's only C rated scouts available, so I'm not gonna fire really too many. Maybe I'd fire some of these D minus guys. But in the future, you might see that there are A rated scouts on July 1st that other teams haven't re-signed. So I'd fire, let's say my C rated OHL scout to go hire an A rated OHL scout on July 1st. Always offer them the max contract if possible, if you have, uh, especially if you have owner mode turned off, as they will always accept your offer if you give them a max deal. Once your scouts are sent out, they'll start to do reports on players and you'll uncover information on the draft class. So if I scroll down and click on, it's really sticky, come on. If I click on view draft class, I'll start to see the things that my scouts have uncovered. What are the potentials of these players? What are their player types? What do my scouts rank them versus what central scouting ranks them as? What kind of gems can I find? Oh, is there a guaranteed medium elite player in like the fourth round? Those are the things I want to look for. What leagues i can sort by leagues i can sort by player type and uh, by uh, position and you'll know more as the season goes on obviously there's not much to know right now but it will tell you things like oh he's a plus in shooting but b minus on defense it'll tell you also the nhl eta i'll show you all that at the draft towards the end of this video you can also scroll down and see the draft board another thing that you'll want to look at towards the end of the season at the draft You'll see the watch list if you pin any players. And you also see the projected picks. Like right now, let's say, uh, let's say I finished last in the NHL, I win the draft lottery. Obviously my pick is projected number one. Or it could be that whatever, I, something happens in the postseason, losing the second round, I'm picking 24th or whatever. It'll tell me pick one Montreal 24, pick one Florida first overall, etc. And I'll say who's available around that point. Now this is something that is broken. For example, if I have the 18th overall pick, it'll show me the players that Central Scouting has like 13, 14, and 15. Not who's going to be there at 18. So I never use this uh, scout recommendations thing because those players won't be available at 18. They would have already gone. I have to go back to the draft board and look at it that way. I can also use this screen to see my forward depth. Where am I? Do I have some weakness? My defensive depth and my goalie depth. All those charts. What's weak? What's strong? What's neutral? What positions should I be targeting? Continuing to scroll down on the trade and improve box here. I can also go to player search. This is a huge plus that was added. I think in NHL 22. I love the player search. You can look for specific players. You say, okay... I really need a left-handed defenseman who is, let's say any role, but I need him to be a, an offensive defenseman who is left-handed. Uh, I don't want any prospects who are like unsigned, so I want at least 22 years of age. I don't want anyone who's going to be too close to retirement, let's say 31. I also can't take on a salary of more than whatever, let's say uh, uh, eight, seven million, just throwing numbers out there. And I don't want it to be an expiring contract, so I'll say at least two years. And last but not least, I'll say I need the player's overall to be at least an 82. Okay, or an 81. Who comes up when I do this? Only one player, what? It's Matt Grizzlick. All right, great. Matt Grizzlick, you fit the bill exactly. I need you. But it could be that there are like 100 players that come up if your net is much more broad. Then you start to refine your search, like as if you're looking for a scholarly article on EBSCO. You start looking, you say, okay, I want this age. Okay, this kind of contract. More, more, more until you find the player you want. Any player that you have watch listed, you can go to player search and click on watch listed and it'll bring you to that list. You can watch list players all the time in free agency, in the trade trading screen. When you do that, this is the place that they come to. Go to player search and click on watch listed. Cannot be overstated how helpful that player search is because sometimes you find players you don't even know you were looking for. You need some bottom six help, you just do a little search and you find, wow, this guy has really low trade value. I, this is a great opportunity for me. So I would really recommend if there's something that you use whenever things aren't going well in your franchise mode, why are we losing this player as a really bad plus minus? I'm gonna trade him, look in the player search. 
Now, moving on to the next screen, we see Manage Rosters, starting with Edit Lines. When you go to the Edit Lines screen, this is a bit different in NHL 23 as well. This year, you have the ability or, you know, quote, ability to edit strategies. If you click on Triangle, it'll tell you what line do you want to start with. The starting line could be 1, 2, 3, or 4. But you can't actually change what your, what your coach's beliefs or system is. So it's pretty much, it means view strategy. I don't know why it says edit strategy when it really just means view strategy. I can't edit anything here. So I can view the strategies, but I can't edit the strategies, even though it says that I can. I always start with my first line, so it's not a big deal. Uh, line chemistry, usually I put out a video on this. Uh, I'm not sure if I will this year. I'm still considering it because it's just, it's not a complicated system anymore. It used to be, okay, I need check marks. I can't have too many X's. I need this kind of line score with this type of player type. Now it doesn't even really matter. My line score, if, I, if a check mark is a plus one, a dash is a zero, and an X is a negative one. It used to be, I think you needed like a plus nine with the right player types and a plus 13 with the wrong player types to get a plus five. So I have a plus one, plus one, so that's two, and Caulfield zero. So I have a plus two on this line with playmaker, playmaker, sniper, and it gives me a plus five, all because I have Caulfield and his zone abilities and X-Factors and Suzuki with his X-Factors. So it doesn't even really matter if you get a good line score or a bad line score or the player types. It all matters about which players have X-Factors. If they have X-Factors, the chemistry will be there. If not, it's almost impossible to get chemistry. On this second line, I have plus one, plus one, so plus two, and then plus three. So I have a five as my line score. Sniper, playmaker, sniper, but my z I have a zero because there are no players with X-Factors on this line. So it's frustrating, but that's basically the new system. And if you want to know how to add X-Factors to your players, I'm going to show you that in just a moment once I get finished with showing you the lines. When you're changing lines, you can qu uh, click on Square on PlayStation to change your own players quickly. Dadnov, Gallagher, can just swap them up and down. You can press on R1 for quick substitutions of players who are scratched. I could bring in Dadnov for Monaghan as opposed to having to click him and go through the process of unscratching him and putting him in the lineup. I can just do that with the R1 quick sub. Defense, I can go ahead and look at my defensive line. Same thing for chemistry. I have a plus three on this one, but no chemistry because it hasn't. I have no X factors. Team strategies, again, you can look at them, but you can't actually do anything. So not a big reason, in my opinion, to even really provide that for me because I don't really care since I can't touch them at all. Um, you can also go ahead and look at your special teams. This year at NHL, there, instead of just special teams, it goes power play, penalty kill. And on the power play, it now uh, allows you to edit the roles of the players on the power play. This I like. I'll tell you that. This I like. If I press on edit strategies, really it's just the roles, I can say who's the distributor, who's the finisher, who's the puck carrier, and do we want to have a defensive, normal, aggressive, what kind of face-off formation do I want to have? I keep it as normal because I let the coach decide in-game. But basically, whoever you want to be scoring the goals, like your Ovechkin, your Stamkos, you put them as the finisher. Aside from that, uh, you know, I put players on their offsides. Caulfield, a right-handed shot on the left. I would make him my finisher. Um, and you can do the same thing on power play line two, four-man power play, etc. You can also look at penalty kill. This year in NHL, it's not just PK1, PK2, and three-man PK1, three-man PK2. You have three regular penalty kills and three three-man penalty kills. Uh, same thing, you can go ahead and edit the strategies, quote, edit the strategies, and just get, it only does face-off formation. If you click on penalty kill formation, it'll give you a little video on what that formation means. Example, the diamond. I won't click on it because it plays a song and gives a whole speech and I don't want to get copyright stuff, but it gives a little quick tutorial video on what the diamond formation is. If you click the touchpad on PlayStation, for example. So I have the three man penalty kill, all that. Extra lines, four on four, three on three, extra attacker. Shootout is the only thing that I like to touch. I put my highest shooters. Caulfield, 89-89 for his slap shot and wrist shot accuracies. He's going to shoot first. Suzuki, 87-88. Ah, Drouet is 88-88. I'm going to swap him with Suzuki. He's going to shoot second. That's how I do my shootout lines. 
goaltenders, my healthy scratches, and no lines if there's someone that you have to fit in there. You can also once again click on the options button to switch between the NHL and the AHL. So now I'm also going to show you how to add, add, add X factors to players if you want to play with line chemistry. For example, this line with Hoffman, Doc, and Dadnov has no chemistry. I'm going to add maybe like three X factors to Evgeny Dadnov and see how that affects the line chemistry. So what I got to do is back out and go over to the League tab. Very glitchy. Click on Edit Player. And by glitchy, I mean very sticky, the menus are, unless you're on PS5. Edit player and scroll down to the player that you want to edit. I want to edit Evgeny Dadnov. Click on him. Go ahead and press on abilities. The first one, the very first one, will be a zone ability. If you click on it, it will be gold. If you click on any of the others, they will be silver. So here are whatever. I'll make them uh, shooting oriented. Heat seeker, make it snappy, uh, one timer, on whatever. Throw all kinds of X factors on getting Dadanov, and then you go ahead and save. That player now has those X factors forever until you take them away because players cannot gain or lose X factors after their draft year, basically. So you can draft a player who has no X factors, and I believe. By the season start, he might have some. I'm still trying to figure that out. But into the future, like year five, you have a 90 overall player who didn't have any X factors. He still won't have any X factors. So now I go to edit lines. I should have some line chemistry for that second line. And Dadnov gives it a plus one. There you go. If I added more to Hoffman or Doc, it would be plus two, plus three, plus five. So I've gained Dadanov, there you go. It also helps for the power play, for example. That power play might have a plus five now, thanks to that. And uh, yeah, I might as well keep it for the rest of this uh, tutorial video. If you want to edit anything else about the player, their player type, their whatever, any attribute about them, you have to do that before your franchise mode begins. If you want to change their potential or their overall, any of that stuff. After the franchise mode has begun, you can only change very basic things like the sticks that they use. And then you can also change their X factors, which I find is pretty game breaking. They won't let you change... Like I can't change a playmaker to a sniper, but I can add all kinds of X factors. What I like to do to keep the league balanced is that I also go to other teams and find which of the top players don't have X factors. I make sure any player, maybe like 88 overall and up gets X factors, but it's a lot of work on my part that unfortunately shouldn't be there. I would like the, the, the game to just give them and take them away based on season performances from year to year. To edit a player before your franchise mode begins, you basically just have to go back to the roster tab that I was on at the beginning of this video, and instead of click on active roster, when you click on roster, click on edit player, go to the team that you want, and then just have a, <laughs> have a field day with whatever you want to change. Uh, also, when you're in the line changing edit line screen, clicking L3 for me on options, I can scratch a player right away. I can do best lines to see what the coach likes. If, I, if I'm not happy with, I just want to do whatever, I don't want to take care of it, I can just say, hey, head coach, do whatever you prefer. And I can also go to roster moves. When I'm at roster moves, I can send players up or down from the NHL. I can multi-select, let's say Suzuki and Caulfield, I'm disgusted with you, switch to in the system. Byron and Slavkovsky, you're coming up. I'm calling you to the NHL. Because there are no waivers, it doesn't matter right now, but during the season, if that player was waiver eligible, Caulfield not, but if Suzuki, yes, he would have to go through waivers and other teams could claim him. But then I say, okay, I'm happy. Suzuki, Caulfield, you're doing a good job. I want you to come back up. I'm going to sort by overall, send uh, whatever, these two guys back down. You can only have a maximum of 20 skaters and three goalies in the NHL, so you can't uh, exceed that. You can go back to edit lines or best lines, whatever you want, and uh, that's roster moves. You're going to use it quite a bit throughout the season when injuries take place or whatever else. So best lines there, coach changed it up. AHL, best line, head coach preferred lines, and there you go for roster moves. That's about it for the lines. Not much else to say about that. So I'm going to back out from here. If you want to click on view lines right under edit lines, it brings you to all the lines of the teams around the NHL. You can't see their line chemistry. You can't see what, but you can see their overalls and X factors, uh, depending on what your fog of war things are. Check any team in the league, check their special teams, do whatever you want. Same thing for the AHL. If you switch to AHL and then click on view lines. From here, we can scroll down past roster moves. You can go there or do the shortcut from edit lines. And we can go down to morale. If you have morale turned on, that will be available. If you have morale turned off, it will not be available.
At this morale screen, you can see what the overall team morale is, as well as the locker room chemistry. I can see what kind of uh, player types you have. The leaders in this room are Gallagher, Monaghan, and even Caden Gooley. Great to have a young player who's a leader, because he'll only get better. Their overall, their, uh, their uh, morale, I think everyone has pretty high. Yeah, no one has low morale, really. Montembeau is the lowest, but his is still high enough. He's he, high enough. He's happy. Uh, does anyone have low locker room chemistry with anybody? No, no one has low locker room chemistry. They do have best locker room chemistry with anyone. Edmondson's best is with Pizzetta, who's in Laval. Uh, Armia's best is with Monaghan and High with Caulfield, Edmondson, Dvorak. So if you have morale turned on, you want to keep note of these things. If you trade away a player's best friend who couldn't even be on a different team, whether it be NHL, AHL, or a different team in the NHL, acquiring that player's favorite player or trading him away would positively or negatively impact the chemistry of the, the morale of that player. You want to have high locker room chemistry, high overall team morale. It goes into team performances, player performances, stuff like that. As I said, I'm not a big fan of it, but if you are keeping it on, you'll want to draft leaders, acquire leaders. You'll see in the draft screen later on, it'll tell you about play, uh, personality types. Good for the locker room, not good for the locker room. So keep all that in mind. I don't do it too much, like I said. Uh, AHL is the same thing that I keep even less note of. But I think every game opens up with 69% as locker room chemistry. And from there, it'll be up to you to get it uh, as high as possible. After morale, we see the injury report. This is where you can go whenever an injury occurs on your team. You may have forgotten when is that player coming back. And it'll also tell you, obviously I have no injuries right now, but it'll tell you, for example, let's say it's, uh, I don't know, like a leg injury. And it's a playable injury. It'll say, all right, he's, let's say it's, September 17th, he's coming back September 22nd, but it's playable right now. If you put him in the lineup, it's negative six acceleration, negative four speed, and negative whatever, etc., etc. When they are fully healed, obviously they're back to all their attributes that they have, but if you play them with injury, go to the injury report to check what attributes are being affected and also what day are they coming back fully healed. Next, we also have the progress reports. I love looking at the progress reports. It shows me how well my players are growing, my players with potential over the course of a season. Season. For example, we'll look at this after we sim through a season, but it'll say like Nick Suzuki has grown whatever it's natural growth, statistical growth, or morale growth. Now be careful. You may have a player who wins a Stanley Cup and says, I want a crazy contract and because they grew from an 82 to an 86, but it was all morale growth because they're happy about winning the Cup. They were getting good minutes. Next season, let's say your team isn't as good and you're playing them on the third line, they're going to drop back down to an 82, but you just signed them as if they were an 86, 87. So be careful when you see real growth, natural growth, and morale growth. Morale growth is great, but it's not necessarily permanent. When you also scroll through the progress reports, you'll see looking over Nick Suzuki, it says next to his number and position that he has no X factors. If I scroll down to Cole Caulfield, it'll show me Suzuki's X factors. If I now scroll down to Dadanov, it'll show me Caulfield's X factors. This has been glitched for the last couple of games, still hasn't been fixed, not sure why, but nothing new in EA land. So be careful, you may get fooled and think, oh wow, this player has X-Factors. Nope, they're the X-Factors of the player above them because X-Factors never get uh, added or removed from a player unless you go ahead and do it yourself. You can check the progress reports of the players in your NHL, on the NHL team or in the system. This means AHL, Juniors, Europe, anywhere that they're playing, it'll show you what they did. So you have some random 50 overall who's now a 77. Wow, I'm going to see it here and that there was a great growth over the course of the season. So you can check NHL in the system and of course all players, uh, skaters, goalies, all those different positions. Really fun to look at this after a season to see who grew, which random prospect that you forgot about from three years ago now had crazy growth. Really enjoy doing that. Last for the Manage Rosters tab is Captains and Jerseys. From here, you can change. you. So you have the option, basically go over a player who has a letter. You can assign or unassign the captaincy uh, with uh, pressing square or assign or un unassign alternate captaincy with the triangle. You can either do one captain and two alternate captains or I could unassign Nick Suzuki's captaincy and assign someone else an alternate captaincy. I can go three A's and, and no C or one C and two A's. I could also change someone's jersey. Actually, as you can see, it's Suzuki with Gallagher and Edmondson right now. 
But if I go ahead and take it off and then I put them, there you go. So if I want to change someone's numbers, all I gotta do is click on them. If I have retired jerseys turned on, all obviously all the red numbers are ones that I cannot choose. If they are hollowed out, another player already has them. So I could click on it and now Anderson and Gouli would swap numbers. Or I can click on one of the black numbers and that would give the player that number without having to take it away from someone else. You, you, of course, you see Gretzky's 99 is retired and the rest of the numbers are retired within the organization. NHL, AHL, same as before, uh, by swapping outside of the screen and then entering that screen. If you have morale on, assigning and unassigning captaincies will have a big effect on their level of morale as well. And closing off the manage rosters tab here, you see that your team status and team chemistry are also going to be made aware. You'll, you'll be made aware of it by the game. Team status, seller, it totally goes by overall. The Canadians could be a winning team, but if my if the players on my team are not a certain overall, it'll classify me as a seller team. So it doesn't really mean that much because you're the one who decides, are you a buyer? Are you a seller? Basically, are you a contender or not a contender? And team chemistry, caution, 69%, they say to work on it. Okay, moving over to the manage contracts tab now. Here you see the days until the resign phase. How many contracts do I have ending soon? The view contracts page is an extremely useful page. I go here very often just to kind of do a count sometimes. Okay, how many uh, defense do I have again in the NHL? One, two, three, four. Ooh, I only have five. I gotta go call somebody up. Yeah, I need to shoot in. But is that really good? Look at my depth, blah, blah, blah. So I love coming here for a lot of different reasons. You can click on the options button and, and go between all different teams teams, who's on expiring contracts, who has a lot of cap space, who doesn't have cap space. That's pretty fun in my mind. Uh, going back to all forwards. From the contract screen, there's a few things you can do. If you are already in the season, if I click on Nick Suzuki, I can trade him, I can view his profile, that's it. If I'm in the off season, I could buy out a player and it'll tell me the buyout penalty for buying him out. If the player is signed, but on an expiring deal, it'll be over after this season, I can offer an extension to that player. Now, with morale turned on, whether or not they want an extension will play into the, the dollar value. It's probably the only reason that I would say I would maybe want to play with morale on, because with morale off, even your captain who's been here for 20 years will not care about taking a discount. With morale on, if they have high morale, they're a leader, blah, 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 well, then they're going to take less in their contract. Morale turned off saves a lot of headaches, but you also have to pay a bit more in contract sometimes when realistically they wouldn't be costing as much. So Cole Caulfield, let's say, for example, he would want 4.775 for five years. Uh, I could do a contract between one and four years between to keep him as an RFA. But as soon as I hit five, six, seven, or eight years, his expiring status would be as a UFA, unrestricted free agent. If he's unrestricted and I don't sign him, he goes to free agency and anyone can sign him. If he is a restricted free agent, let's say I don't f I figure out a deal with Cole Caulfield, but he's a restricted free agent, that means I can qualify him. And when he goes to free agency, if someone wants to sign him, they have to pay me draft pick compensation to do so. Unrestricted free agents can leave my team for free. So Caulfield, I would like to keep you as an RFA. I'll give you a four-year deal. Something else to keep in mind is that very often you can offer a player 85% of their asking price. So if Caulfield's four-year asking price is 4.675, 85% of that is 3.97375. So I could do four years at 3.975. And he would 99.999% sure accept that because there's no reason he shouldn't. It's 85% and he wants the extension. If he didn't want the extension, then it's either going to cost more or he just won't accept it at all. But keep in mind, the 85% trick gets very useful later on in franchise mode. If you're 20 years in and your third pair D wants 8.5 million, using that 85% trick is extremely useful. So not much more to say aside from that at this point in the resign phase and free agency, there's much more to do here, but you can see that you also gotta be, gotta be careful with the contract demand. Right now, for example, Cole Caulfield, really cheap. Like his contract is unbelievably cheap. In the real world, he'd want like eight, nine million. If Cole Caulfield goes on a tear this season, the longer I wait to sign him, the more it's going to cost. 
Conversely, sometimes might have a player like, let's say, Drouet, who let's say maybe I don't believe in him. He's making 5.5. He wants 4.4. I'm going to play him in a third line role this season. I'm not really expecting a lot from him. Maybe if he has a subpar season by the end of the year, now he's only asking for 4 or for 3.7. So be careful. If you really want to bet on someone, sign them early. But if you think they might not do well and the demand could come down, well, maybe you wait on that player. Especially in RFA. You don't need to feel pressured just yet because you could always ha uh, own their rights for later on. Unsigned players, you can give them entry-level contracts. These are automatically three-year deals. You cannot change that. And it's either it's between the lowest or the highest two-way contract. When you start your franchise between 750 and 950k, if you offer it during the season, they'll accept it automatically. Been a dream of mine to join this team. I will not let you down. And oh, now he has anxiety with his new team. If you offer the contracts during the re-sign phase, you have to wait a few days for them to sign it. But if it's during the season and you offer them an, an ELC, entry-level contract, they will always take it right away. Goaltending, same thing. Uh, extension, see that Jake Allen's making 2.875, but next year he's making 3.85. His extension's going to kick in. So keep that in mind when you look to trade for players. Jake Allen, it's going to say, yeah, he has one year left on his deal. But really, he has an extension that kicks in for two years after that. So you want to keep note whenever you trade for a player and you think they have an expiring deal. It could be that they don't. So we'll, I'll touch more upon uh, the contract situations at the end of the season that we simulate. Same for free agency. At the start of free agency um, at, of your franchise mode, you won't see much. In July, you'll see much more. But keep in mind the difference between UFAs and RFAs again. UFAs, you can sign right away for whatever, and if they accept, then they're yours. If you sign an RFA, for example, Alex Formentin, if I offer him a contract, I will have to offer Ottawa compensation. If I give Ottawa, uh, Formentin, a two-year deal at 1.75, I need to give Ottawa my third-round pick if they accept. Now, you might be trying a thing like this, and you're saying, oh, but I'm trying and saying I don't have a third-round pick, but I do have a third-round pick. Well, check and make sure on the trade screen that you don't have a different team's third round pick. You must have your own third round pick, your franchise's third round pick, to be able to give it to that team as compensation. If you scroll down, offer sheet compensation right here, you want to know how much you'd have to give. If the contract's under 1.385, no compensation. All the way up to if it's over 10.5 million, you have to give four first round picks. So really make sure that you want to sign an RFA because it can get costly. There was a glitch at the, when NHL 23 first came out that RFA's compensation was not working if you signed an RFA, but that has been patched and is running as smoothly as ever. So we'll touch more upon that later on. The higher staff screen, we saw this before from the coaches. Maybe I didn't go into the screen itself, but as you can see, these are all the current coaches who are available. Usually again, just like your scouts on July 1st, there will be many more tempting offers. Uh, also keep an eye out, sometimes there are some fun names, retired NHL players who are coaches or scouts. It'll be fun to get those on your into your franchise, but that is the higher staff screen if you want to check that out. Uh, and pending free agents, if you ever want to check out ooh, who's going to be a free agent next season as of now, who has an expiring contract. Of course, most of these will likely get signed, but you can sort by all. You can sort by who's going to be a UFA. You can sort by who's going to be an RFA. And then you can also look at this year, in two years, from uh, three years from now, all skaters, goalies, whatever you want. So it kind of gives you an idea if you're kind of hoping, when do I need to clear up money? What year is going to have a lot of maybe big free agents? Obviously, better to look at pending free agents closer to free agency. Not right now, a whole year away. But to keep in mind for, you know, how much money do I have and how much do I want to play around with. Now switching over to the owner tab. Now again... Not a big fan of the owner mode, and I don't have too, too much to say about this. If you want to look at your owner goals, you can see what your owner expects you to do over the course of the season. So you can get your big, fat check of $50,000 by selling out 29 games. I make hundreds of millions of dollars, and they give me a pittance of $50,000. Like, it's a joke. Come on, where's my owner's union over here? Anyways, tells you the state of the team, owner happiness, blah, blah, blah. You can also look at pr proposed relocation. Obviously, a team like the Canadians 
are not going to move. Owner willingness to move is low. If I press it, it gets rejected. We've invested a lot of effort into building a prestige for this franchise. I don't want to walk away from that. Okay, that option is now gone. I can only do that once per season. Owner willingness to move? No. Owner happiness? Amazing. Great. Thank you, Mr. Jeff Molson. Uh, Bell Center. Obviously, the Canadians Arena. Team Store is the highest rated facility. The concessions are the lowest rated facility. Upgrade and maintain. Keeps the owner happy. Keeps the fans happy. 86 on 100. 78 on 100. I gotta purchase a parking lot. I can update the bathrooms. All that stuff. Operations budget, if I press on square, shows me allocated, remaining, minimum, maximum. I can play around with it. I've seen the top. I have 560,000 funds remaining. I'm going to dedicate more to promotions. La, la, la. Exit without savings. I don't want to touch it too much. It is fun, I find, like to set all these things. But the only problem, the biggest problem, is that I find it gets stale very quickly. I'm not saying the idea isn't right. I'm just saying that... After I set it and I'm fighting for $30,000, like it kind of gets like, why am I doing this? You can set prices for tickets, lower bowl, upper bowl, club seats, executive suites, club des jardins, make everyone happy, uh, team rankings and sales. You can also check out, uh, well, obviously nothing to see right now, but how much revenue is being generated in the last, you know, game tickets, concessions, merchandise, parking in the last seven days, 30 days, year to date, all time. This is fun. You can kind of get a ranking of how am I doing versus the AI owner, GMs, whatever. Not much competition, but still just to see. And for the budget, you can see what is the marketing budget. Play around with that. Higher, lower, blah, blah. And you can also... Uh, can I stop? Okay. Income statements. I got to be like a financial advisor. Revenue, expenses, year-to-date profit, operations budget. This is kind of cooler. They've added this in recent years. Uh, that we already looked at. Sorry, operations budget. Uh, and then we see the promotions. This is interesting. At the start of the year, you can make bobblehead nights and things like that. And if you go into the game to watch it, you'll be able to see if I click on this Maple Leafs game and I say, tonight is Nick Suzuki bobblehead night. If I go into the game, it'll have like a little Nick Suzuki bobblehead. And you know, that's fun. It makes the fans happy. And it's a cool little thing at the start of the presentation of the, of the game. I wouldn't be surprised if it's even gone, but in previous years, it's been like that. And that's basically it for owner mode. That's all there is to it. You can set all those numbers, keep track of them if you like, and there's not much of a stake to it, especially if owner mode firing is off. You make a few thousand dollars or you don't, but if your owner is happy, it's not a big deal. Now on to the league tab. We see, of course, we already saw the edit player. We can go here to change X factors and things like that. And of course, we can also check our settings if you want to change any settings that you, you know, like such as the injury sliders, turning injuries on or off, changing the draft class, make it high, make it low. But the biggest thing to look at here is the record book. So in the record book, you can check out your franchise's records by scrolling to your franchise. Of course, the older ones have tougher ones to beat. The Canadians have Guy Lafleur, Jean Bilevaux, lots of tougher ones to beat. And you also see, so the all-time record and the current record, that's the fun part because you can see who is my current longest serving player who is my current all-time point scorer in of players who are currently on on the roster so that's franchise you can also well before i check the entire league i can look at career numbers on the canadians single season records current and all time rookie records current and all time and single game records all time saves assists points and goals in a single game <laughs> shout out to newsy lalonde with his six goals back in 1919 i can also look at nhl records games played most goals uh points assists over the course of your franchise, especially a 20-year franchise, some of the generated players, will, and even maybe even the real ones, will creep into these rankings. And you can remember them. Hey, I remember it's been like year 20. Oh, I remember I had Ovechkin for a couple of years. He broke those records. It's fun to go back and look at them and remember fondly in all those good times. Again, career, season, or rookie records that you can try and get your players' names into over your years of franchise mode. So now that all the screens in franchise mode have been covered, I will bring you over the course of an average season. So first I'll send to the first preseason game. A few screens are going to pop up saying, hi, I'm the owner, things like that. Uh, the coach wants to talk. Nine game trial warranted, I'm guessing, for uh, Slavkovsky. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Slavkovsky? What's the plan for this year? The plan is to be NHL, trial, send down, let's say, the real world, NHL. What's he going to say here? I disagree. I think we need to give him a nine game trial. So you can agree, which 
which might make him happy. Disagree, which is guaranteed going to make him negative 10 morale. Or try and persuade, which is risky. It's a, I, Sometimes it gives you the odds, I think, but here's not telling me the odds. Sometimes it says 50-50, but it's risky to try and persuade him. So I could agree, which will give me the opportunity to solve, but it doesn't guarantee that it solves. Whatever, let's just agree, see what he says. But are you sure this is the right move? Yes, I think the player deserves a look. Risky or promise? Now, here's the thing. If I promise, this is what's broken with morale. I'll give him the trial. But if I promise, and then I say, I'm going to keep him up because I think he was pretty good. Then the coach says, nope, remember, you promised me. we got to send him down. Well, buddy, did you not see that he just scored like four goals in six games? So, you know, it's not a guarantee that he's going to know what he's talking about. Let's try and persuade. Let's see what happens if we persuade. And that's a good point. I'll let you decide this one. Okay, thank you very much. Plus five. So the the conversations are always a bit... Nah. And then it says morale plus one, even, so it's, even though it said plus five. But whatever. Keep on simming. Here's the salary cap. What else does it tell me? Budget allocation high. I've set the maximums. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Allocate the budget. And here we are. So when I simulate a game, I click on it. I can either play it or I can simulate it. By simulating it this way, I'm able to go into this little slow sim screen and watch. I can press on the triangle to speed it up. Press on X to sim the whole period. It tells me who scored the goals. I could also go and scroll through who took shots, who hits, who took penalties, how were the face-offs, what's the net chart, all that kind of stuff. You can look at uh, where the shots were, where the goals were. You can see what the shots are there, 12 to 10. Next period, 4 to 1. And third period, 8 to 1. Oh my goodness. The Canadians beat the Red Wings 8 to 1 with the shots 34, 29, I think. Then you can look at all events. It'll tell you everything that happened, goals and penalties. You can click on the box score for either team. It'll tell you more details. Anderson hat trick, who was a plus one, who was a zero, who took shots, what are their shooting percentages, time on ice, face off percentage, blah, blah, blah. Goalies, same thing. And you can see the three stars of the game. You cannot, unfortunately, go back and do this after a game has already been simulated. You cannot go back and see the box score. So that's why it's important to, if you want to see it, to go in and watch it. If you sim over it, it is gone. There is nothing you can do about that. So let's start simming through an average season. I'm going to say let's sim to June. Things will pop up over the course of the year. I'm not going to show you every single pop-up. Uh, Auto-assign the promotion nights. There's going to be trades. There's going to be central scouting. My, the scouts are going to say, hey, the new sc central scouting report is out. All that kind of stuff. I'm just going to sim through the season. I'm going to pause at the important moments, such as waiver claims or maybe, or even at the uh, trade deadline mini game. But until then, I'm going to continue simulating. And also keep note that waivers, remember what I said before about if a, wa if a player is waiver eligible, they can get claimed if you send them down. Waivers go into effect, I think it's always the same day, October 6th. So during the preseason, you can send players up and down, no problem. But as soon as the season begins, if a player is waiver eligible, you cannot send them down without there being risk of them getting claimed. Uh, I want us to win our regular season home opener, 30,000. So if I win this, the home opener, you give me 30,000. And if I sell out 29 games, you give me 50,000. Not very uh, proportionate there. Uh, so I'm going to let this all simulate. I'm not going to take care of anything. I'm just going to let it go. And I'll pause whenever... Oh, Cole Caulfield, tough. I'll pause whenever something interesting comes up. So here's the first potential waiver claim, Colin D'Elia on waivers. You can view the player info, you check them out. Do I like the overall? Do I like the contract? And you decide, do I claim or decline? From there, you move on. All right, so we arrived at the trade deadline and the pro scout will ask you, what do you want your status to be heading into the deadline? Do you want to be a seller, conservative seller, conservative buyer, a buyer, or keep your current block, which I think is seller anyways. So I'm going to say, let's say I want to be a seller. I think the Canadians are a losing team at this point, or that's uh, slightly above 500. You can enter the trade de deadline or continue simulating. Now, keep this in mind. If you enter the trade deadline and you make a trade, all of your lines will be reset to best lines. If you make a trade at any other time before the trade deadline, a, a day before, a month before, and you make a trade, it'll say, Okay, you made the trade, now go fix your lines because a player you traded is no longer there. In the trade deadline mini game, if I enter the deadline and I make a trade, all the, tr the lines, if you worked hard to set your lines, your four-man power play, your three-man penalty kill, all that stuff, it will be reset. So be careful. If you intend on making a trade, I would recommend stopping the day before and then doing the trade then. 
Now, there is a slight downside to that because if you have players on expiring deals, the closer you get to the deadline, whether it be this day or at 11 p.m., 11 a.m. to this 12 p.m. deadline, an expiring player will have more trade value and the value will only get higher. I'm not sure how much higher, it's hard to say, but Dadnov's value right now is higher than it was at the beginning of the start of the at the start of the season in the in the preseason as an expiring deal, as a player who's been performing well enough, I think. Uh, yeah, 26 goals and expiring deal. Yeah, you can get a lot of value for this. So you can use the fine trade. You can go find your own deal or you can have the computer do it for you. Make some trades, do what you like. You can find the trade, look at trading blocks, look at the draft board, league stats, and also trade summary. What are the other deals of teams making that teams are making around the NHL? Another downside to the trade deadline game is that you could be in the middle of trying to make a trade and then it'll say, oh, by the way, here's a trade that's being offered to you and it totally interrupts the trade that you're trying to do. You could be at the deadline with seconds left about to press the proposed trade button, but then it says, ah, oh, sorry, there's another team that's sending you an offer and it doesn't let you send the one you were even working on. That's pretty annoying. I wish you could reject calls. Uh, you can look at the top 10 players who are available, all players that are available for depending on what team, or you can look at players who have been sold. Shattenkirk is sold, the Ducks sold on him. Who's off the market? Uh, who was on the market then came off the market? Uh, what teams are interested? What are they? What are the teams looking for in the return? A top goalie prospect? Are they looking for um, what's his style? What kind of do, what kind of things do you have versus do they want? It's pretty interesting. Just too bad that your lines get reset if you make a trade. But whenever you're done, you can exit out, and life goes on as it was. After the deadline, there might be some trade alerts, like the, the Flyers and the um, Kings make this trade right here. Then over Ellis, it'll give you the major trades. There'll be some probably some players on waivers as well. You can pause, you can go to the activity feed. Um, that was on, oh, oh, I'll show you if I, if I stop the simulation. And by the way, so many injuries with the slider at 50. It's so annoying. I'm pressing best lines every two seconds. I do not recommend having the slider too high. If I go to the league tab and click on activity central, activity feed at the message center, whatever you want to call it, you can see the other trades that are made around the NHL if you're curious. Uh, player and pick trading. And you can look at what else happened around the league. But um, aside from the deadline, I don't look at that too often. You can look at other things like the, like the news updates, uh, injuries, etc. But yeah, aside from the deadline, I don't look at the activity feed too, too often. So we now approach the end of the season. Doesn't look like the Canadians are going to make the postseason. Maybe the last couple of wins here. No. Well, 40, 34, and 8. I don't think they made the postseason. The season has ended. Stop the sim. Uh, owner goals evaluated. I passed the sellouts and you added 50,000 to the funds. Woohoo! All right. You see that in the Eastern Conference, we did not make the postseason. But after a season, there are a few things that you'll want to check out. Your team standings, your player stats, and all that. So you'll go ahead and enter the Stats Central. Click on Team Stats if you'd like to see how your team did. And then you can look at the, your division, your conference, the entire NHL. And you can see, you can sort by wins, by goals for, goals against per game, power play percentage, penalty kill. Where did your team stand? I would recommend also looking at this throughout the season. So you can see, oh, my team's doing well, but my penalty kill is really struggling. Or why isn't my team doing, you know, yeah, that, those are all the questions you can ask yourself. When I look at the player stats, I can see who did well, who scored a lot of goals, who had a bad plus minus, who lost games due to injury, who had their good shooting percentages, etc., etc. I can also look at the entire league, sort by goalies, sort by defense, sort by rookie skaters, all different ways that I could sort. Connor McDavid, 110 point season, look at you. Rookie skaters on the year, Shane Wright, 50 points from him. Cutter Gotze, who I added to the game. I just noticed Connor McDavid has no zone ability x factors oh no it's because he's not scouted that's why i would have been very surprised uh then you can also swap to the ahl but that's pretty much it you can look at all kinds of things who led the league in penalty minutes in fights in time on ice per game all kinds of stuff who had the most fights this season just for funsies four fights from McEwen and reeves Furthermore, you can go ahead and look at the playoff tree, even if you're not in it. You can check out which teams are playing against which, and you can follow it along as it goes all the way to the Stanley Cup Final. Uh, now, pretty much, it's not the offseason just yet, but you can sim to the draft. There's going to be stuff that pops up between now and then, but not too much until uh, the game is ready to tell you who the Stanley Cup champion is.
And then by the end of the postseason, I see the Stanley Cup champions, the Calder Cup champions. If I won, like let's say the Laval Rocket were in the AHL, my farm team, I could send NHL players who aren't waiver eligible. Or, I don't know, sometimes you can get players who are waiver eligible through, uh, you can sneak them through if you don't think they're going to claim, etc. Down to the AHL to try and help out your team. Um, but if your both teams are in it or both teams are not in it, it doesn't work as much. But if you're only your farm team is in it, you could send NHL players down to help out your team if you're trying to push for the Calder Cup. Draft lottery. This is extremely rare. Wow, I'm like even shocked that I caught this on camera. Usually at least one position is changing. Four jumps to one, eight, nine, nine jumps to two. This is a perfect draft lottery. One, two, three, all the way down. So no draft lottery changes right there. You can check out Central Scouting one last time. As I bring you to the draft, you'll also get notified that there are some draft interviews. After the retired players, though. Retired players, not much in year number one, but you can see you know, Joe Thornton. The players who were in free agency like Dubinsky, Como. Players who weren't really around anyways. Goaltenders as well. Alex Daylock retiring at 35, a bit young. You can also see the coaches who retired. There are the scouts who retired as well. I can see that Alex Daylock and Matt Irwin are both retired players who are now scouts, who I could go and hire if I wanted to. Draft interviews now. If I go to the draft interviews, these are very, they can be very useful. Now, for example, I didn't scout anything. This is actually a good template to show you. Let's say I did no scouting whatsoever, or maybe I did do my scouting, but I don't have the player type. Or, or the uh, NHL ETA of a certain player. If I go to Connor Bedard and I say, okay, I want to interview Connor Bedard. I know nothing about him, let's say. I can figure out through the three questions I'm allowed to ask him. I can ask him, what is your play style? And right away, without having to scout him for multiple weeks, he's going to tell me, okay, I'm a sniper. All right, thank you. Now, how ready are you to make it to the NHL? Connor Bedard's going to tell me that he thinks he's ready. There we go. He's NHL ready. I have one question left. I go back to a new topic. These are the ones I like to ask. Player type, NHL ETA, and if you have morale on, then you can ask for his personality as well. And uh, it takes a long time to go through it, but I can say, how would you describe your personality? And he would tell me, I'm a consummate professional. I get along with everyone. Bam, boy, I own don't. How about that? I guess our time is up. Dot, dot, dot. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Bah, bah, bah. A lot of conversation, a lot of fluff, I find. So I know nothing. I knew nothing, or I knew maybe his potential, but I didn't scout him. And I now fully uncovered, not even two bars, nothing. I fully uncovered his player type. I fully uncovered his NHL ETA, and I even got two bars of his potential uncovered, even uh, a bit of X factors, just from that interview. So they can be extremely helpful. NHL ETA is very helpful when it comes to the draft, because if a player is NHL ready, it means that their overall is 77 plus. Could be all the way, I've never seen a player in a draft higher than an 84 overall. 77 to 84, I say what I'd say the range is. If the player is one year away, it's around that mid to low 70 overall. Three years away in the 60s, four years away, 50, 60, and five years away, it could be anywhere from 48 overall all the way to the low to mid 50 overalls. Now, this is important because you could find a player at 30th overall or at 40th overall, and it'll say NHL ready or one year away while everyone else is four years away. So, ooh, I'm going to draft that player, and he's like, I already know that he's going to be a 77 overall or something along those lines out of the gate. So that's when it's good to use uh, interviews and when it's good to keep all that in mind. After those are complete, it brings you to the draft. Before I hop into the draft, I can also keep in mind that this is the beginning of the off-season. So now's a good time to go and check out the progress reports if you'd like. You can see who grew over the course of the season. I see Suzuki's up to an 89 overall now. He has 22 modifiers. And it looks like most, if not all of them, are natural growth, statistical growth. Good. This is good, solid, um, continuing and believable growth. As opposed to maybe Dadanov, who, yeah, wow, he's up to an 87, but a lot of statistical growth, not natural growth. It's not going to stick because he's 34. He's going to be there for a bit, but it's not going to be there forever. He still has top six potential, for example. So if he has top six potential and he's an 87, that's okay. But let's say he was an 87 with top nine potential. That means by the, by the start of the season, he'd likely drop to 83, 84. Even more so if he's an 87 with bottom six potential. Don't get fooled. By the start of the season, he could be 81, 82. So be careful. Caulfield, Hoffman, I can sort by growth. Slavkovsky's up to an 81. A lot of good growth from him, statistical and natural. 
Uh, hopefully that'll carry over into the off season and into the beginning of next season. So there's the player progress reports that I can check out at the beginning of the off season. I could also go into the draft. When I go into the draft, I can either trade up for picks or I can simulate to my own pick. If I press sim to pick, it'll. Uh, if I press sim options, I can press sim this pick alone or sim to pick, sim to next round, sim entire draft. Let's say I, I want to sim to pick, but first I see, are there any picks that are up for grabs? Right now, none of the top three teams want to trade their picks. If the team does not want to trade their pick, it's going to be very hard to get it from them. But you see the little target, the little green target above the number five for the Rangers? That means the Rangers are open to trading their pick. So if I wanted to trade up in the draft, trading for that fifth overall pick would be the one. And very often, teams are willing to trade their picks if they have the picks of other teams. This is Dallas's fifth, not New York. They got it in the Lundquist trade in the real world, so they're more open to trading it. I also see that the Flames are open to trading the 12th overall pick, and so on and so forth. So if I send to the 15th overall pick, and I don't know much about these players because they haven't been scouted. I see Mishkov, I see Bedard went, all that. I can make my own pick. I can sort, obviously if I'm scouted, I would know a lot more. So I, I would look at what's their NHL ETA, what's their potential, what kind of uh, attributes do they have. Because if a player, and I, it's too bad I can't show you if I didn't scout. But you'd look on the next page from after summary, you'd go down to role assessment. You'll see the skill assessment. If a player is A plus shooting, C minus skating, B plus pass, puck skills, D physical, that's what I call a wonky prospect. Those are prospects who are going to have like 88 acceleration, but 72 speed and 97 wrist shot accuracy, but 82 slap shot accuracy. I'm not a big fan of those prospects, so I'd keep an eye out. I prefer the well-balanced prospects, but regardless, moving forward, I also want to keep in mind in year number one and year number two of the draft, real life players, if they have a picture or if they're 17 or 18 years old coming from a Canadian league, they are real prospects. Real prospects, you're not going to find a guy in the fourth round who's really on the Brandon Wheat Kings of the WHL who is medium elite. The game is not going to make a random 17 or 18 year old who's playing in the world right now medium elite in the fourth round. If they were actually medium elite, they'd be a top prospect. To find gems, you have to look at generated prospects, the ones who come from the States, the ones who are coming from Russia, the ones who are coming, the Ukrainians, the Germans, the Norwegians. Those are the guys you have to go for. Those are the ones who may have higher potentials, even though they're being drafted later. So I'm the Canadians, Justin Côté, bienvenue à l'équipe from the uh, Voltigeur, from Drummondville. Uh, we don't know what his, what his potential is yet, but I do know that he's 66 overall because I don't have that on Fog of War. But I'd have to scout my own player to figure out his potential, which I find annoying. Uh, anyways, I can do all that. I'm just going to sim to the end of the draft because there's nothing else that I want to do. But that would be drafting. After this point, there isn't much more to say aside from you want to go sim to the resign phase. It's going to tell you you have scouts who are expiring, so go to the assigned scout screen. You'll want to look, okay, highlight this guy, nothing. Oh, this is when I highlight him now in the bottom left corner, it shows resign scout. You can offer your scout. I usually go max and then I go back one. So I'll go like 135K as opposed to the max 140 that I could offer this scout because having already been in my franchise, the scout is more likely to resign. If I was going for a brand new scout in free agency, I would sign a max deal if possible. Tells you, you have, okay, you have some players you got to go resign. All right, we'll do go to contracts. And now here are my options. UFAs, I can sign or release. RFAs, I can sign or qualify, which means I can sign them down the road. Oftentimes, let's say Caulfield wants 6 million, but I only have 3 million. I could qualify him and then maybe in August, if nobody sends an offer sheet, which is a bit risky, maybe in August in a month, his demand will come down for one year. Instead of one year 4.1, he'll accept for a one year 2 million. So I could try and wait him out. UFA, or I could say, hey, Josh Anderson, I'm not happy with you. I would like to buy you out. And I'll tell you, we'd like to buy out the contract for 1.833 million for eight years. And you select yes or no, buy him out. So once you take care of all of that, you can look at your unsigned players as well. Who did you get in the draft? Who do you want to sign to a contract? Keep in mind, if you sign a player like Justin Coty to a contract right now, uh, my unsigned players, he cannot play in the AHL. 
the American Hockey League. He either plays in the NHL or you send him back to juniors. If you get a European player, this guy Stefan Eriksson, Stefan Eriksson, if I sign him, I can play him in the NHL, AHL, or that's it. I cannot send him back to his team. I'd rather leave this guy unsigned, let him play on the, whatever team he's playing on in Europe. And same thing for Kuti, let him play in the juniors for another year or so. Do not sign a player from a Canadian major junior league, the OHL, the QMJHL, the WHL, until you're ready to play them in the NHL or they've run out of eligible years and now they're 20 years of age and you need to sign them to an ELC or lose them and you sign them and now they can play in the NHL, the AHL because if they're not at least 20 years of age and they're from a Canadian major junior league, they cannot play in the AHL. Okay, so let's say I took care of all of that. I want to sim to free agency now. As I sim towards free agency, the guy, my, you know, my pro scouts, my assistant GMs are going to remind me, oh, remember to do this, got to qualify that guy, I don't really care right now, let my scouts go, oh, the morale has changed, so I, and you know, I, if I didn't re-sign a player, or if I released a certain player that a lot of players liked, that's going to affect team morale. But here I am in free agency, I can go into free agency, see what's up, who's available, what's going on, who's an RFA, who's a UFA, I can sort by overall, I can sort by potential and try to find some gems, who are some players that, some good young players that teams have let go. I can also look at, I can sort just by the UFAs, just by the RFAs, if I'm looking at maybe making one of those um, offer sheets, or I can even trade for that player's rights. I don't need to just steal them through an offer sheet. I can look at goaltending, who's available as a goaltender. So free agency can be fun. Too bad there's no mini game that goes along with it just yet. So that's player free agency, and there's also staff free agency. So don't forget to check out that higher staff screen if you're going to be seeing, okay, is there maybe a new, a better head coach? Ah, now there are some A-rated coaches. Ah, now there are some, what kind of scouts do we see? B-rated scouts. So slowly, slowly over the years, your scouting will become like all A scouts, and your coaches will get better as well as you find the right guys that you say, okay, this is someone I want to build my team around, sign him to an eight-year contract, so on and so forth. And from there, that's just about it, ladies and gentlemen. Starting on July 1st, you can look in your contracts and see who are the new players who you may want to offer extensions to. Players who previously had two years left now have that one year left. So guys like Hoffman, Edmonds, I could offer contracts to them. But aside from that, that's pretty much it. I sim through the off season and I bring me back to the preseason and I start all over again. So this was an extremely long video, long to make, long to edit, and I'm sure long to watch. I hope that you learned something along the way. Again, if I didn't answer one of your questions or if you still have something in addition to what I've said, be sure to please leave a comment. I'll go back to you ASAP down here on YouTube or join us over on the discord server where there are hundreds who are waiting to help you on demand i appreciate you taking the time to watch this video leave a like if it was helpful i think it was pretty all encompassing as i went through a lot of what can happen in franchise mode remember that it's you know franchise mode is to have fun so i hope that whichever way that it is if you're having a six person league with owner mode on or 48 team with no salary cap whatever you do i hope that you have fun and that this can help you to maximize that fun if you do enjoy franchise mode and all things nhl 20 23 and much much more hey check out the channel we would love to have you join the team the team would be that much stronger here on the channel with you as a part of it so be sure to subscribe we'll be made aware of all of our uploads including our nhl 23 franchise mode currently going through our series with the san jose sharks but many more series to come whether you're watching now or in the future check out the channel see what we're up to and we'd love to have you join we also do player simulations going through 20 plus seasons of the greatest prospects in the nhl today break down an analysis of the real world of hockey and much much more but i'll stop there thank you again once more for taking the time to watch and i look forward to seeing you again in the next one